Overwatch 2 will feature a ton of PvE content. We will have a complete story experience. On November 1st, 2019, the biggest lie in modern gaming history was made. Overwatch 2 PvE is the definition of overpromise and underdeliver. With promises like hero skill tree talents, a branching dialogue system, hundreds of hero missions, but more importantly, the a complete, complete story, story experience. experience. And almost one year ago to the date, we we got what happened to Overwatch's 2 PVE, but more importantly, where did the promises and also the time go for it? Well, today we're going to look at exactly what caused Overwatch's 2 PVE to fail. And to begin, we go to August 10th, 2023, where we got season six that not only has the brand new hero Iliari, but the new game mode flashpoint and the whole reason why there's even a two right next to Overwatch's logo PVE. Winston, the mission in Gothenburg was a success. With the release of PvE also comes a whole separate menu that was crafted just to take you into the storytelling world of Overwatch. It has tons of various Easter eggs, intels of maps and organizations, and also conversations between the heroes. It was a cute bonus, but what we're mainly here for are the story missions that has a total of only three of them. And this was the first sign of failure, only having three missions upon launch, one of which was already playable at BlizzCon of 2019. And the two other missions? Well, they were already done by the time BlizzCon Online took place in February of 2021. So if seemingly all three of these missions were done by the time 2021 rolled around, why did they take an additional two years to release them? And better yet, why didn't they just release them when Overwatch 2 first released in October of 2022? But hey, maybe all three of these missions were gonna be worth the wait. So let's go into the first mission that's called Resistance. <laughs> this. This is why people begged for a PvE mode in Overwatch. The animations, the voice acting, the action, the music, everything that we experience from the cinematics on YouTube are now in Overwatch in a playable format. If there's one thing that people can argue, that is the quality of the cinematics in Overwatch 2. But once we get past the cinematics... <laughs> Yeah, that uh, th th that quality quickly goes away. Now, while I'm playing with AI that's just a skill above your average ranked teammates, it was actually forced upon you to play with other humans when PvE first launched. But once you pick your hero and you hear the mission debrief and you get to playing, you start to notice that this is just the most generic A to B gameplay ever! There's no creativity. There's no additional ways to fight the enemy. You're just left with your same hero kit that you normally play with in the multiplayer experience. Now, I will say in Overwatch's 2 defense, this PvE experience is actually very similar to other single player experiences you find in other games. Like Spider-Man, you fight similar enemies. You just go from point A to point B to point C. But with Spider-Man, you evolve throughout the game with different abilities they find in the skill tree. Hey, wait a minute. You might remember the infamous skill tree promise in Overwatch 2 PvE, where you were gonna be able to expand a hero's kit with different abilities that you would never find in the multiplayer experience. Being able to make a bowling ball of ice with May, move your healing pod with Soldier 76, and have multiple pulse bombs with Tracer. And in a 30 minute Star Watch event live stream where 10 minutes were reserved afterwards, words to talk about the future of PvE, Jared, the executive producer of Overwatch 2, would make the announcement that skill trees were going to be cancelled in Overwatch 2 PvE mode because it was just too hard to make. We won't be delivering that dedicated hero mode with talent trees. This would be the first of many promises broken by Blizzard when it came to PvE, but one thing that they wanted to continue to promise was the release of PvE. And after completing the very first mission, which is kind of weird when you actually complete it because it doesn't have any of the heroes that you actually played with in that mission seen in the cinematic jumping onto the ship we would play the next mission that would be brand new to everybody called Liberation. Liberation is where we get to meet the brand new hero Sojourn if you're still stuck in 2019. So it really doesn't have that wow factor in the year 2023 because we've known about her for four years now. But here this time we got to defend the streets of Toronto from the No Sector organization that 
brings us to more generic A to B fighting! Go to Lodi Dock and fight waves of null sectors. Go into the subway system and fight more waves of null sectors. Go into the city of Toronto and fight more null sectors! Oh, I like the variations of the mini bosses with the brain suckers and the slim thick lady robots. I just don't care. And what makes me care even less about these PV missions is the fact that I still don't even know why I'm fighting the no sector. And funny enough, Sorgen and her team even say that they don't know why no sector is attacking Toronto and all these cities. Why are they hunting us? No idea. But after this, I'm gonna find out. But they're gonna get down to the bottom of it because they see all of their Omnic brothers and sisters with these controlled hats that are obviously from No Sector that they just can't remove off of them. To me, I think that's just kind of bad storytelling because if you want me to care about the cause, then tell me why the cause is even happening. Now, I feel like this could be excused if, say, maybe in the fourth mission of Overwatch 2, we'll find out why No Sector is attacking. But um, Blizzard likes this thing called uh, money and they don't want to release all the PV missions at once because they don't want to charge you $60. They want to charge you $15 in segments. So this leads to this question that is very important to answer in a story mode. Why are we fighting no sector? Oh, they're going to ask the one and only person that might have an answer to that in this next mission called Ironclad. <sighs> Hey, this time the cinematic actually lines up with the mission that we're about to play because now they limit us to only four playable characters, which I actually like. You see, it's really cool to see almost the whole entire Overwatch hero roster in these cinematic movies, but when they don't line up with the mission, and on top of that, when you only give them one chance to talk with a very generic voice line, you lose that coolness factor of having all these heroes interacting with each other because they're not interacting with each other. But you see in Ironclad, we see a retired Torbjörn and a good guy Bastion and a hella skinny Brigitta and a traumatized Reinar all talking with each other at an even rate and we find out more about these hero stories. And that's I think another mistake of Overwatch 2 PvE is that they just don't really tell any story at all. They don't progress the lore of Overwatch like what we all wanted them to do. They just kind of say hey here's no sector we gotta fight them. Go! G go! Uh, please? <laughs> but when we're finally gonna get down to the bottom of what these little hats are coming from No Sector, g guess who shows up? It's No Sector! But what's different here is that we actually traverse Gothenburg, an exclusive PvE map where we gotta move a payload to shoot down the No Sector ship and also this big giant robot thingy. And while this is just more generic wave fighting of No Sector, what I appreciate about this mission is that you at least have the freeze turret and the boop turret that adds a little bit of creativity when fighting the No Sector robots. And while it's just a very simple addition, that little addition can really make or break how you beat this mission, especially when you get into the harder difficulties. While Ironclad is not the most in-depth mission, it's definitely the best out of the three, not only because of the gameplay, uh, but more importantly, because of the ending cinematics. While everyone loves to dog about Overwatch's 2 PvE difficulty, how boring it is, bring up skill trees, the price points, and just other various problems that make the Overwatch 2 PvE at best boring, and and at worst, excruciatingly terrible, it's all forgotten for a few minutes when you see these beautiful mini movies of these heroes just talking with each other, being hopeful for the future of Overwatch, all while this beautiful orchestra plays this music in the background, talking about how they have to bring Overwatch back. And it takes you all the way back to the year 2016 when you first watched an Overwatch cinematic, seeing Reaper fight Winston, seeing Genji almost kill Hanzo and seen soldier chasing ghosts throughout the streets of Dorado. And it's at this moment that you want more of Overwatch 2 PvE. And you start to crave it even more once you realize that it ends on a cliffhanger when Sombra and Widowmaker come to the headquarters of Zenyatta after he just had a flashback with his old brother Ramatra and Mandana. I mean, you're telling me that I have to wait however long to see what happens to my boy Zenyatta? Well, no, you actually don't have to wait any longer because Genji comes and saves Zenyatta from Sombra and Widowmaker because in a small segment in the BlizzCon online showing off PvE, 
there was an animation of this! This was gonna be the fourth playable PvE mission where you obviously play with Genji and Zenyatta, but I think you also team up with Sombra and Widowmaker because I'm gonna be guessing that the map that it takes place, which is on India, is falling apart. And we see that actually in the BlizzCon livestream where various parts of the map start to catch on fire, start to fall, and so you have to team up with your enemy just to survive, all while also fighting with each other. It just baffles me why they didn't at least bring this playable mission with the other three missions, but what confused me even more is that they didn't make Gothenburg or this unreleased PvE map on India a playable map in PvP. Now, I'm guessing Servaso is actually inspiration from this India PvE mission, but we won't ever really know. But I feel like what made PvE justified when it comes to at least developing the map that it plays on is that you can turn that into a PvP map. They did that with Rio, and they did that not necessarily one-to-one -one with New Queen Street, but at least took the assets of that Toronto mission and made the New Queen Street PvP map. Like, PvE did not need to waste money, and that's something that a lot of people will try to explain to me, is that Blizzard is a business. They're not here to waste money when they can just make a legendary skin, and trust me, I already know that. Blizzard's a business, they're here to make money, but Blizzard should also be a business and not make false promises. So while there might be a numerous amount of reasons as to why PvE failed that I mentioned throughout this whole entire video, I think the number one reason why PvE failed is because Blizzard wanted it to fail. They didn't see that it would make as much money as say releasing a legendary skin or other things that have a quicker time around. While there was good people and still are good people working on the actual game at Blizzard, the executives wanted PvE to fail because it wasn't going to make as much profit as skins. And while Overwatch has evolved throughout the years with tons of collaborations and game modes and numerous seasons with hundreds of skins, we are still only left with three PvE missions. A hollow shell of an empty promise that only leaves us one question to ask. What if?